And to continue this subject about poverty and education, here's Dr. Sandy Darity. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Now, we see stories about educators working against the odds in high poverty schools and working to try and engage students. In, in, in your research, what have you seen as some of the challenges happening in our public schools? So I think the primary challenge is that we actually divorce kids or lose them during the elementary school years. And we do that uh, by giving them a, a curriculum that's not particularly challenging, not interesting, that doesn't stoke their imaginations, and doesn't keep them engaged with, uh, with school as a place that is exciting and, and a source of interest. Uh, I think that when we give kids a very challenging curriculum from the very beginning of their school years, uh, they stay engaged, uh, they're very excited about school, and they maintain that in future years. So uh, from my perspective, the most important challenge that we face is ensuring that all of our children get a high level critical thinking curriculum from the various, very earliest years that they're in school. Well, looking at that, how, how do you go about making sure that students are engaged, especially we, we hear a lot about African-American males in school. How do you go about making sure that they are inspired? Well, I don't think that African-American males are any different from any other students. Uh, and I think that the factors that might cause them to lose interest in school are much the same as any other child. So, uh, so the question is, what do we do to make sure that all kids remain engaged in school? And I think that one of the programs that shows a great deal of progress and promise is uh, a project called uh, Bright Idea or Bright Tomorrow. Uh, and this is a curriculum and instruction reform that's aimed at providing all kids with a gifted level of instruction. Uh, and this is from the kindergarten years. Uh, there are a number of places in North Carolina that have experimented with introducing this change into their schools. Uh, the first school that I visited to see that was using Project Bright Idea is Thomasville, North Carolina. Uh, there's a project that's headed by uh, one of my colleagues at Duke, Angel Harris, that has introduced Project Bright Idea into the Wake County school system. Uh, and our experience with these programs is that we find that uh, all the students do much better, not only in terms of being uh, critically engaged in school, but also in terms of their performance on those, those indicators we like to use, like standardized tests. Uh, so, uh, so I, I would think that it would be very wise for many of the schools to try to replicate what happens in Project Bright Idea. And, and let me add, the key dimension of Project Bright Idea is the fact that you actually have to retrain the teachers in an intensive way so that they're prepared to provide a high level of curriculum and instruction to all the students, not just students who are presumably identified as being especially gifted. Now, a recent report came out from the Department of Education and it showed inequalities in education for students of color. And it cited inexperienced teachers as well as lack of specific classes and harsher punishments. Yeah. What can we learn from this report? Well, I think that frequently we look at young black males as being different. Uh, but what I would like to argue is different is the way in which they're perceived and treated frequently. And so that can lead to uh, an over excess of punishments that they might be confronted with when they do something wrong. And we do have a lot of evidence that, you know, if a, if a black male does something that's wrong and a white male does something that's wrong and it's similar, that the black male in a school system is likely to get the harsher punishment. Part of this is what we call pre-adultification. I mean, that's, that's a mouthful. But, but the idea is that frequently young black males are treated as being older than they actually are. Uh, so a, a nine or 10 year old black male might actually be treated as if he were 13 or 14 years of age. And so people don't respond to these kids in a developmentally appropriate way. And they may provide excessive punishments or administer excessive punishments for them. A lot of this has to do with the way in which teachers perceive the kids. And so uh, one of the dimensions of Project Bright Idea in the retraining process is uh, teacher dispositions towards kids 
by race, by gender, by age, et cetera, are something that, that's addressed uh, very, very closely uh, with an effort to have teachers gain a different way of looking at kids and actually treating them as kids in, in much the same way. Now, are there other ways that uh, teachers can get involved to make sure that, that every student, no matter what background, is uh, ready to take on perhaps college and other types of achievement? Well, I mean, again, I think that the key is teachers have to be comfortable about trying to provide a high level of instruction to all their students. And so whatever ways in which we can better prepare teachers to do that, uh, then we're more effective in, in achieving the aims that you're talking about. Now, we had talked earlier about community, because at one time it seemed like when, when you were involved, when kids were involved in education, it was like the community was involved. It wasn't just, say, the teacher. It seemed like the whole community was involved. How important is that? Do we need to like come back to that type of, of approach? Well, I'm not so sure how far we've come from it, uh, and let me, let, me, let me explain why. Um, the black community in particular displays a much more intense commitment to education than the white community in the United States. And let me give you some illustrations. Uh, so one of the illustrations is the fact that if you were to look at families with a similar socioeconomic status, black and white, that is uh, parents with similar levels of education, similar occupations, and similar uh, incomes perhaps, Black kids from those families get more years of schooling and more degrees than white kids from similarly situated families. Uh, another piece of evidence is, is from a very new study that I've just done with uh, Yunju Nam and Derek Hamilton, where we've used the panel study of income dynamics data to look at people's wealth positions. And we find that uh, among, among whites, uh, there's a set of parents who don't provide their kids with any financial assistance for going to school for higher education. And the median wealth of those families is approximately $85,000. Now, among white families that do provide support to their kids for higher education, the median wealth is about $168,000. Now let's consider black folk. Among blacks who do not provide any financial assistance to their kids, their median wealth is less than $5,000. And for blacks who do, their median wealth is only $24,000. So blacks who are inclined to provide financial assistance for their kids to go to college have considerably less wealth than most of the white households who don't provide any financial assistance for their kids. So there's a tremendous commitment in the black community to, toward education. Now, of course, there's a distribution. There are gonna be some families that are more committed, there are gonna be some families that are less committed. But on average, I, I think we have tended to subscribe to a myth about thinking that the black community is not particularly committed to education. And on, on average, that's not the case at all. Now, if our viewers want to find out more about the research that, that you're doing, is there somewhere they can go? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they, they, the easiest thing is actually to, uh, to send me an email at william.darity at duke.edu, and I'll be glad to send them a host of references and citations that they might want to use to look at. Dr. William Sandy Darity, we thank you so very much for stopping by and sharing your insights with us. Thank you for having me.